Okay, so this video is going to focus on membrane transport, things that you learned your freshman year that we're going to build upon a little bit, uh, facilitate diffusion, passive transport, active transport, as well as looking at what's called membrane potential, which will be a new concept for this year. Okay, so our first bit here is going to be our, uh, this is going to be review of freshman year stuff, passive transport. All right, remember passive transport is our diffusion. So our diffusion is our net movement of molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. You can see that happening here in this diagram as time progresses to the right here. You can see how the molecules here are moving from an area of high concentration on the outside of the cell membrane to an area of low concentration on the inside of the cell membrane. And eventually they will reach equilibrium, right? Remember we try to reach the goal of diffusion was to reach that point of what we call dynamic equilibrium where diffusion doesn't stop. Things are still moving back and forth. They're just now moving back and forth at the same rate. And that's what's happened over here on the far right here. So this doesn't require any direct input of metabolic energy, meaning this doesn't require ATP. No ATP is required to move things from high to low because that's where they naturally want to go. Things want to spread out. They want to have their space. Okay? This, the purpose of diffusion is going to help bring materials into the cell as well as move materials out of the cell. This is going to help maintain solute and water balance, okay? in particular by moving water back and forth. If you remember, osmosis is our diffusion of water. And so this diffusion movement is going to help maintain concentrations of salt and chloride item, ions and potassium and because it's going to help maintain our solute and water balances, mainly by moving water back and forth. So some of our molecules are going to require a little bit of help. They still want to do diffusion, so this is still going to be a type of diffusion, so it's not going to require any ATP, so no metabolic energy here. Things are still going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. The problem we have here is we've got charged or very large polar molecules here. And these charged or very large polar molecules, if you'll remember, they are not able to just slip through the lipid bilayer. They get kicked back out because of this hydrophobic region here in the middle with those fatty acid tails. And so these, diff these molecules are going to need these protein channels and these carrier proteins. We talked about this when we talked about the parts of the membrane. We talked about these protein channels that can form this tunnel so these larger or polar molecules can move through. Same with carrier proteins that can help get things, get molecules across and through that hydrophobic region of the cell membrane. So they're still doing diffusion. They're still moving from high to low. This doesn't require any energy. The difference here is now, though, they've got a protein to help them out. And so that's the facilitated part here, is this helper protein that's getting these molecules across. Some examples that we have here are aquaporins. Aquaporins do exactly what they sound like. They let water pour in. Okay? They basically form a pore or a hole. A so they act like a protein channel within the cell membrane so that large amounts of water can move across the membrane. Well, small amounts of water can diffuse across the membrane on their own, but the aquaporin allows larger amounts to move back and forth, which allows the cell to quickly um, regulate and maintain its concentrations. Some, another example here are these ion channels. For example, sodium ion channels, potassium ion channels, these, mole these ions are charged, and so as these ions move across the membrane, they can do what's called polarize the membrane. Okay, so for instance, if I have a lot of sodium on the outside of the cell and not a lot on the inside, I can create across the membrane a charge where this side is more positive and this side is more negative. And that's going to be very important to some of your cellular functions, in particular nerve function, other types of cellular communication, to be able to get the cell 
to for the cell to polarize and for it to polarize like that I might need these ion channels that will allow large amounts of sodium or large amounts of potassium to move very quickly across the membrane initially they're moving from a high to a low concentration okay and then they're um, and they're moving so fast that the the ion channel can't cut them off quick enough. So it's a, it, they are diffusing across until that ion channel slams shut. Okay, So these are, like I said, we will revisit these when we get into cell communication. But it's just an example of facilitated infusion. Another example of needing a protein to help move these ions across the membrane. So if y'all remember, your active transport then is going to be the opposite. Your active transport is going to require your direct input of energy. This is going to require ATP. Okay? You cannot do this passively. The molecules don't just flow. Because what you're doing here is you're taking things from a low concentration to a high. You are cramming more in where they do not want to be. So you have to force them. Think if you've got a really, really crowded elevator and you're trying to fit one or two more people into it, right? You're cramming and you're forcing them in there. And so that's what you're doing to these molecules. They don't want to naturally go that direction. So it requires energy to force them that direction. These are also going to require membrane proteins. Okay? And so they'll require membrane proteins that will help them do this. And the goal here is you're trying to establish as well as maintain concentration gradients. There are certain parts of the cell at certain functions where you need a large amount of a particular molecule kind of congregated in one particular area. This will be really important when we talk about cellular respiration. For cellular respiration, for our cells to be able to make, for any cell to be able to make ATP, they have to get a concentration of hydrogen ions on one side of the membrane. And then those hydrogen ions will flow back through an enzyme, and that's what will make the ATP. But if you don't pile up all the hydrogens on one side of the membrane, you don't force that concentration gradient, that won't work, and it won't happen. And so active transport is something that's going to be very important in our cellular respiration, making a concentration gradient. It's also important, again, in our nervous tissue here with our sodium-potassium pump. That sodium-potassium pump is going to help our nerve cells maintain that particular polarization that they like to be able to conduct an action potential. Okay, we mentioned the action, the polarization across the membrane, having the different charges. Okay, and once a message travels down a neuron, that neuron has to reset for another message to be able to travel down it again. And that's where that sodium potassium pump is going to come into play. But that's going to require energy to force a bunch of sodium out where they don't necessarily want to go and force a bunch of potassium back in. You can see that happening in this picture here. You can see the sodium here joining with this protein. Here's your ATP. So you'll notice on this first one, there's no phosphate attached to the protein. The ATP donates a phosphate, it phosphorylates it. So now this protein has a phosphate attached to it. And when that protein has a phosphate attached to it, it has changed its shape. It now points to the outside to release that sodium where it was not open on the outside before. So now you'll notice in the next step here, so this goes down like this, right? Our phosphate is getting ready to leave. So potassiums have come into this protein. That phosphate is now gone from the protein so it goes back to its original shape where it's closed to the outside but open to the inside. And that can help push the potassium back inside. But it required that ATP. If that ATP didn't phosphorylate that protein back here at step two, didn't drop that protein off, then that would never, the protein would never change shape and you would never be able to pump those ions back and forth across. So it's going to require energy. It's going to require membrane proteins to do active transport. Again, diffusion, no energy, facilitated diffusion, proteins, but no energy still. So a few other examples of active transport are your endocytosis and exocytosis. Okay, remember, both of these are examples of active transport, so they require ATP. 
And these are for really large molecules, moving large molecules either into the cell with our endocytosis or out of the cell with our exocytosis. So let's look at the exocytosis first. So with the exocytosis, you're going to have your vesicle inside of the cell here. And if you'll remember, your vesicle, the membrane around your vesicle, is made of the same phospholipids that the cell membrane is. You can see how they're the same color orange here. And so when this vesicle fuses to the cell membrane, it will create a continuous membrane here, and now it can release its contents to the outside. There's no disruption to the cell membrane. This is all the same material. This is all phospholipid. Basically, you just added to the cell membrane here. You added the area of the, the surface area of that vesicle into the cell membrane. And so the exocytosis is going to be used to secrete large molecules out of the cell. Endocytosis will basically be the opposite. I've got this large molecule here. The membrane itself is going to form this little pit or this invagination. And so the membrane will invaginate in here, and eventually it will close itself off. And so when it closes itself off, you will have, basically, there's a middle step here where you have a vesicle here and this membrane across the top. So it seals the membrane, right? I can't have a hole in my cell membrane. So it seals the membrane, and then I have this vesicle, and now this vesicle can float on it off into the cell into the cytoplasm and can go wherever it's needed within the cell. So I'm bringing large molecules into the cell. And again, both of these are going to require energy. So let's look at some different types of environments that we could put cells into. Some different external environments here. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is this term called tonicity. And tonicity, you're going to hear it a lot. You hear it in your hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic, um, but we're going to use this term, we're going to talk about the tonicity, and the tonicity is going to be the ability of that solution to cause a cell to gain or to lose water. So again, the tonicity is going to be based off the solution. This is the solution's ability to make a cell either gain some water or lose some water. Okay? And we've t your freshman year, we talked about hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic. And so that's what the tonic part is. Okay, that's the tonicity, that's the solution, being able to cause that cell to gain or lose water. So let's look at our different environments here. So the first environment we're going to look at here, according to our list, is the hypertonic environment, which is going to actually be this one way over here on the right. So our hypertonic solution, if you remember, hyper means more, and tonic, remember we're referring to the solution. So in a hypertonic solution, we are talking about a cell here, or not a cell, I'm sorry, a solution where the solute concentration of the solution is very high compared to the cell. So in a hypertonic solution, again, hyper means higher, and tonic, we're talking, referring to the solution. So the solution has more solute than the inside of the cell. So if the solution has more solute than the inside of the cell, that means the solution has less water. Let's make up some numbers for the solution over here on the right. Let's say the solution is a 20% salt solution. So if it's 20% salt, then that makes it 80% water. And let's say our cell here is... 90% water is in our cell, which leaves 10% solute for our cell. Well, water, so our solution is hypertonic. Our solution is hypertonic because it has a higher salt concent or higher solute concentration than our cell does. But what moves in this case, because remember the cell membrane is um, is semi-permeable. What moves in this case is the water, and water does diffusion, right, osmosis. So that means water moves from high concentration to low concentration. So if my water concentration in the cell is 90, and it's 80 outside of the cell, water is going to leave the cell. So the cell will end up 
shrinking or crenating. It'll shrivel. Again, another word that you'll sometimes see here is crenation, or it will crenate. So in a hypertonic solution, again, it's referring to the solution. So I have a higher solute concentration outside of the cell than I do inside of the cell, meaning I have less water outside of the cell, and water moves high to low, so water will leave the cell, and the cell will shrink up. In an animal cell or a cell with no cell wall, we see this shrinking, this shriveling, this crenation. In a plant cell or a cell with a cell wall, that cell could possibly go through what's called plasmolysis. Okay, it's, I'm, it's a little hard to read on that diagram there. So plasmolysis, it's telling you there that that cell has been plasmalized. Okay, remember, lysis is to rip, to tear, to burst. Okay, so with plasmolysis, remember I'm talking now about a cell with a cell wall. A cell with a cell wall has that cell membrane attached on the inside of the cell wall. And so if that cell loses too much water, then that cell could eventually, that membrane could tear off of the cell wall. And that's the plasmolysis. You can see here how this membrane is ripping off the cell wall. That will kill the cell. This is what happens when a plant doesn't get enough water and the water is leaving the plant cells going out to that dry soil. Okay? And so if the, when the plant eventually dies, that's because this plasmolysis has happened. So in a cell with no cell wall in a hypertonic solution, it will crenate or shrink. In a cell with a cell wall, it could possibly go through plasmolysis. That cell membrane could rip all the way off the cell. So let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Now, if I have a hypotonic solution, again, hy now hypo is below or less than. And again, I'm referring to the solute that's in the solution. So in a hypotonic solution, this is over here on the left, my solution has less solute. So now let's say I'm in a 5% salt solution, which means that leaves me 95 percent of the solution left to be water, where if my cell was still 10 percent solute, that leaves my cell to be 90 percent water. Again, water moves from high to low, so now water will move into the cell. So my solution has less solute, therefore it has more water, and so water moves high to low, so water moves into the cell. So a cell that doesn't have a cell wall, for instance an animal cell, could possibly be lysed or go through lysis. Remember again, lysis means to burst or to rupture. So that cell could potentially take in so much water that it explodes. And so that obviously would kill the cell. In a cell with a cell wall, that extra water is going to go into that central vacuole. And remember when that central vacuole fills up, that pushes onto the cell wall that push, that makes that turgor pressure onto the cell wall and that makes the, the cell the cell be nice and full and so your plants your other organisms your multicellular organisms that are made of plants that have a cell wall all these cells now are full of water and the pressure inside the cell is strong and now they push against one another so all those cells are pushing against one another and now your plant stands up nice and tall. Your plant looks healthy. It has a high turgor pressure. So it looks healthy. It doesn't need to be watered. It's not wilted. It's not leaning over okay, because all those cells are turgid. So my hypotonic solution, I have less solute in the solution, so I have more water. Water goes into the cell. Cells without a cell wall could potentially burst or go through lysis. And cells with a cell wall become turgid, and that's a normal-looking cell. So that leaves our isotonic solution. Iso is the same or equal. Tonic, right, we've got, um, again, referring to the solution. So in this case, I have the same amount of solute in my solution as I do inside of my cell. So if my solute concentrations are the same, then my water concentrations are the same. Water doesn't freeze in place. Right? Water's just moving back and forth now at a constant rate. So it's just coming and going from the cell at a constant rate. In a cell with no cell wall, that's totally normal. 
That cell isn't um, shrinking, it's not creaming, it's not shriveling up. That cell isn't swelling up so much it could burst. In a cell with a cell wall, this central vacuole here is not full of water because there's no extra water now. So that central vacuole isn't full of water. So the turgor pressure actually comes down and the cell becomes flaccid. Okay. That cell becomes flaccid or wilty. This is when a plant will look wilted. There's no turgor pressure built up in that central vacuole, so those cells aren't pushing against one another, so the plant's not standing up straight. The plant is wilted and falling over. And that's when it's at a hyper, an isotonic situation. Again, normal for a cell with no cell wall, but a cell with a cell wall will look kind of wilty. So now let's look at some calculations. Let's bring some numbers into this. Okay, how can we take this our one step further? So we're going to look at what we call osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is just we're maintaining our water balance. Okay, we're maintaining our water balance, which is what allows our cells to control that internal solute composition so that the cell doesn't have too much salt in it or too much water in it or too much potassium. Okay, so osmoregulation is maintaining that water balance. And we can calculate this. We can calculate this using what's called our water potential. Water potential is our pressure potential plus our solute potential. This is the formula for it right here. We use the Greek symbol psi. Okay, and so this is our water potential. And then that's going to be equal again to the pressure potential plus the solute potential of the cell. Again, this will be on your formula chart as well. In addition to this formula being on your formula chart, the one right here for solute potential equals um, ICRT is also on your formula chart. And all of these parts of it are defined for you. Okay? Our I is the ionization constant. So our ionization constant, which is usually going to be 1. Okay? The exception to that that we see is salt. Salt will split into two ions. So our ionization content for salt is going to be two. Sugar doesn't split into ions, so its ionization constant is one. But salt, the ionization constant is going to be two. Commonly it is one, but again, pay attention to if it says it's in a salt solution. C is going to be equal to our molar concentration which should be given to you in the problem, and we're going to do some examples with this. R is a pressure constant. I'm not even going to list it now because of, of room, but again, it's a pressure constant, meaning it doesn't change, and the value is listed on your formula chart. So R is a pressure constant, and T is going to be your temperature. Your issue here, though, is that your temperature is going to be in Kelvin. Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273, I just ran out of room, 273 degrees. Okay, so again, Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273 degrees. Okay, we're going to look at some examples with this. Again, all this stuff is listed and defined for you on your formula chart. It will tell you what I is. It will tell you what C is. It tells you that R is it tells you what temperature is. Okay, and so when we're looking at these, our pressure potential is going to be as always equal to zero for an open container. Like you can see this beaker here in the first picture here. This beaker here has no lid on it. It's an open container, so my pressure potential is going to be equal to zero. In a cell, it's not necessarily an open container, so we're going to have to factor in pressure potential there. Keeping in mind when we do this that water moves from areas of a high water potential to a low water potential. Okay? So just like diffusion where we just said water moves high to low, so high water potential to a low water potential is the direction that water will move. Okay? And we'll look at some um, we'll look at some examples of these. So let's look at this first one here. So a solution in a beaker has sucrose, what sucrose is sugar, right? So it has sucrose dissolved in water with a solute potential of negative 0.9 bars. 
A flaccid cell is placed in the above beaker with a solute potential of negative 0.3 bars. One of the things that I will tell you I think can help you the most in these is going to be drawing a picture. So we haven't, you know, so we haven't even looked at the questions yet, but let's just kind of set this up. It said it was an open beaker, right? It said that it had a cell in it. I don't care that it's a flaccid cell. I don't care if it's an animal cell, plant cell, whatever. It's a cell. And I know that my solute potential of my beaker is 0.9. So that's my solute potential there and my so of negative 0.9. And my solute potential of my cell is negative 0.3. So I've been given solute potential for both of these. Okay. I also know, if you think about it, you know the pressure potential of the solution because it's in an open beaker. It's in a beaker, right? Beakers don't have a lid. So my pressure potential for the solution is also going to be zero because it's in an open container. So the first question here asks, what is the water potential of the cell before it was placed in the beaker? Okay. The water potential of the cell before I put it into a, the beaker is going to be equal to its pressure potential, right, plus its solute potential. Well, in this case, my pressure potential of this cell before I put it in the beaker was going to be zero. And I know that because it was flaccid. Okay? And a flaccid cell isn't exerting any turgor pressure. So this flaccid cell had a pressure potential of zero. It had a solute potential of negative 0.9. Therefore, my pressure potential is negative 0.9 bars. Okay, so for the second one, it said what it asks us, what is the water potential in the beaker containing the sucrose? Okay, so again, it's the same formula, right? Water potential is equal to pressure potential plus solute potential. I'm talking about my beaker now, so I still have a pressure potential of zero. Okay, um, my solute potential of my solution was given to me at negative 0.3. So my overall water potential of the beaker is negative 0.3. So now our follow-up question then, our final question here is, what direction is the water going to move? Okay, well water moves from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. I have two negative numbers here, right? I have negative 0.9 and I have negative 0.3. Water is actually going to leave the cell. It is going to move from the higher water potential to the lower water potential. So it is going to move out of the cell. This cell will possibly go through plasmolysis and die because the water is moving from a high to a low. Remember, these are negative numbers. Right, so if you think about your number line, right, negative 0.3 is further to the right on my number line than negative 0.9. So negative 0.3 is greater than, so it is going to, water is going to move out of that cell. So this is our last example here. It asks you, and we'll do lots more of these in class. It asks you to calculate the water potential of a solution of 0.15 molar sucrose. Okay, and the solution, it tells you that the solution here is at standard temperature. So I'm calculating the, um, I need to calculate the solute potential for this first. Because it didn't tell me, it told me it was a solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that it's in a beaker and my pressure potential is zero. Okay, and so now I need to calculate my solute potential to be able to fully determine my water potential. Remember, solute potential was that formula we saw that I, CRT, which is on your formula chart. So it tells me this is a sucrose solution, so that's a sugar solution. So my I, remember the ionization constant is our I. So in this case, that's going to be 1 because it's a sugar. Okay. My C was my molar concentration, so it told me that it was 0.15 molar sucrose. My R is a pressure constant. It's the same value all the time, 0 0.0831.
Okay, so my R is 0 0.0831. Again, that value will always be on your uh, formula chart. Okay, and then our last value here is our temperature. And remember, your temperature is in Kelvin. And it said it was at standard temperature. So standard room temperature is about 22 degrees Celsius. So I remember my Kelvin is 273 plus the Celsius. So about 295, it's 22 to 23 degrees Celsius. Okay, so about 295, 296 degrees Celsius. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the 23 here. And remember, this formula has a negative on the front. Sorry, I might have left that off just a second ago. So again, that's on the formula chart, so negative I C R T. So when I solve for this solute potential here, I'm going to get negative 3.689674, and my units are going to be bars. This pressure constant here has some crazy units here of bars per moles and Kelvin so most all the basically all the units are going to cancel out your molarity units will cancel out your temperature units will cancel out okay and so you're left with the you end up being left with the bars okay so this is my solute potential for this particular solution again my pressure potential is equal to zero so my overall water potential is just going to be the same as the solute potential negative 3.689674 bars. Okay, and again, we got to make sure we have this negative on the front of this ionization constant here. So again, we will be doing a lot of examples with these in class. You will see these in your osmosis diffusion lab, okay, and we'll be practicing with this.